Tupac, Enrique Acosta, ja u taška, u tako kad nam okali ima njim, Tupac, Enrique Acosta, ima bi iskalo tek kao pipo. Tell me about Arthur Daniels. Well, uh, we're here in the Sequipment territory. Uh, not for the first time, Arthur Emanuel invited me here uh, times before in different gatherings that have taken place. And when the coyote calls, when the coyote calls to the sky, even the stars lend an ear to listen. And this is one of the lessons I learned with Arthur, uh, that there's, there's legendary uh, understandings that underlie the responsibilities that the original nations fulfill till this day. As nations of Mother Earth, and in distinction we can say this, Yes, there are governments, yes, there are states. The government states, such as Canada, the U.S., Mexico. I'm talking about the three bad boys that are tied together in the North American Free Trade Agreement, and you know what I'm mentioning. They're government states, but we are the nations. We emerge every day, every dawn, uh, from our relationship to and with the watersheds of Mother Earth, and also in in concordance with that song, with that call, that that coyote of the air, the atmosphere, the winds, and the energy systems of Father Son, those two, those four together, earth and water, the wind and the fire of the sun, those are our constitution as nations. That what constitute our reality, our consciousness, and our history, and our science, and our spirituality. And based on that, Based on that jurisgenesis, based on those understandings of jurisprudence, based on those jurisdictions which we have the oldest anciently still standing and current, just as modern as any other legal system in the world, jurisdiction of international nationhood, we make our judgment. And those judgments bring us again together, like Arthur Manuel's father did, George Manuel. I went with Arthur Manuel once to Argentina, Mar de Plata, 2005. We beat back the free trade agreement of the Americas, along with some 30,000 folks marching in Mar de Plata to block the plan to extend the North American free trade agreement continentally in 2005. And since then, they've reformulated their assaults. They've reconstituted their, their corporate war machine, which I call the wars of Petropolis, knowing that it is the carbon fossil fuel industry globally that actually mandates policy in all dimensions, financial, uh, environmental, climate. It's the Petropolis, the empire of Petropolis that we're all fighting to liberate ourselves from. You call it a war. It's called a war. Why is it a war? It's a war because it begins with a vision of humans' existence on the earth and not with the earth, in extraction and commodification of the blessings of what should be the, the benefits of living with each other on the earth. So it's a war on Mother Earth herself. I call it even beyond a war. It's a form of terrorcide. It is terrorcide. And war on earth necessarily means on Mother Earth. The terrorcide part comes when you deliberately and intentionally uh, destroy the capacity of Earth to be the mother to our future generations. That's terrorcide. That's an international war crime, not just against us, but against Earth herself. And that convention of terrorcide, you'll never see that coming out of the UN system. Just like the climate agreement that we saw in Paris never went to the degree that it had to because the system itself is, doesn't have the competence of uh, being a natural feedback loop into the natural world. It says it's a war system, a system of extraction, exploitation, expropriation. And the casualties in that war are the very spirit of humanity itself, first of all. And then, of course, the indigenous nations who stand still to today, even in the, as we're talking now in this equipment, to defend the watersheds of Mother Earth here in Standing Rock, in the Missouri River watershed in Mexico along the Rio Yaqui, and extend that continentally, extend that planetarily, and that's the war that we're facing. The wars of Petropolis 
There's the original nations of Mother Earth. So in a few the water defender nations of Mother Earth. People here are talking about doing whatever it takes to prevent uh, the construction of this sort of mega pipeline that would carry uh, oil from the Alberta tar sands to the coast uh, um, in, in Vancouver. Um, if people do that, th there, there may be images on television screens in a few months from now of Canadian police, army, up against some of the people here, gathering here today. How do you think we should view those images? Well, we have to understand that this would be nothing new. The assault of the indigenous nations, the defense of their territories, that's not new. Uh, but we have to understand them for what they are. They're acts of international aggression, of a settler state police mechanism against an original nation defending its territory. In international law, all peoples have the right of self-determination. Since 2007, indigenous peoples have been ascribed recognition as being peoples equal to all of the peoples. That means our nations are also, and our nationhood is also equal, should be treated with equal respect in terms of our self-determination and territorial rights, the rights to well-being, to being well with Mother Earth. Therefore, if a police assault is done upon an indigenous nation in an unceded territory specifically, this is an act of international aggression of a settler state police mechanism like what happened on Grusinson Lake back in 2000, what was it, 1994? The same type of assault could be, uh, in, could be imagined, and we've had that experience already. What's, so, the, role, what's the role of non-Indigenous people in trying to stop that? That's trying to stop history from repeating. We have a government now that talks a lot about reconciliation. What would that mean in the, in the real world when you have a struggle like this? Genocide can't be reconciled. Colonization can't be amended. Genocide has to be ended. Colonization has to be brought to a speedy end, like I said back in 1960, when they said all peoples have the right of self-determination in the UN Resolution 1514. What the Canadian people have to do, just like the people of the Americas continentally have to do, we have to discover our humanity in relationship to the humanity of our original nations still standing on this continent. That's what has to be done. The question is, how far, Mr. Canada, Miss Canada, are you willing to go, are you willing to come to be a human being along with us as children of the nations of Mother Earth? So it begins with that tie to Mother Earth as being a relative with Mother Earth and then following through with that responsibility in terms of the benefits and responsibilities of receiving those benefits from the settler state system, in this case, Canada, at what cost, not just to the environment, at what cost to your very humanity? Are you willing to allow this to be normalized? If you're willing to be allow it to be normalized, you must count yourself as part of the accomplices of an international war crime of aggression of a settler state police system against an indigenous nation exercising its right of self-determination. And what do, what do non-Indigenous people have to gain by standing in solidarity in a struggle like this, which won't be easy? It's a healing process. Colonization is trauma. It's a trauma on the land. It's a colonization of the colonizers themselves. It's trauma, 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 generation upon generation of trauma that's been perpetuated by a culture of colonization. Therefore, what do the colonizers have to gain? They have their humanity to gain. They have the, uh, we have, we're offering the Canadians, we're offering the U.S. in terms of the issue at Standing Rock, the last chance to save your soul as a human being. In, uh, um, in, in the session just now, I, I showed some slides uh, 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 about how much carbon is going to be carried through these pipes um, to be burned and what that means in terms of climate change. What, what, did you have any thoughts while you were looking at that? We call it, uh, in our language, we have a term that's called the uh, uh, istipapalo. It means the obsidian butterfly. 
And what we see now is part of a story that we call the carbon butterfly. The carbon butterfly effect. She's landed several times already. The carbon butterfly flying out there in the atmosphere has landed several times already. You see the global phenomena, the climate chaos. It's not a scenario that's coming, it's here. The climate chaos scenario that's here in terms of our weather systems is also a reflection of the climate chaos that we carry around internally as human societies. The climate chaos that has broken our human relationship with each other and to the natural world, that's what has produced the climate chaos planetarily. What's it doing in your territory? You're, you live in Arizona. We're talking about the very high extremes of global warming and the extension of, of, the, of the, the extension of the seasons uh, to where there is no normal anymore. And the, the concentrated impacts of climate uh, chaos scenarios are just at a regional level. They'll happen in microbursts, for example, where all of a sudden four uh, inches of foot, two feet of water will come down in a certain isolated pocket as a punch on the earth. So the, the climate systems are also being radically modified, even on a micro level. Do you, do you sense Art's presence with us here? I, I sense Art's presence with us here and also his father, as I say. Uh, Art introduced me to the trajectory and some of the history, and I got to meet people who knew his dad when we were down there in Argentina. We spoke about this. Art's father was down there in Argentina during the time of the Dirty War, giving international solidarity to the cause of justice and of the folks in the South. So if there's no uh, doubt about it that the legacy of the Art Manual and his family and the Sequentment people is also part of one of the assets that we would say, the spiritual strengths that we would say, that is to be made available for the fight that's going to happen here, that's been ongoing here in the Sequentment territory against the Kinder, Morgan, Trans Mountain Pipeline Extension, but also an ex example, an exemplary example of how the fight can be taken forward continentally and globally against the empire of Petropolis. This last question, um, how do you feel when you see Arthur's um, children stepping into this space? I think it's just natural. This is how it's supposed to be. This is how it has to be. It's always been a kinship system. Our, we don't operate under the biometric, Eurocentric concepts of kingdom. In this sense, a clarification, yes, although sovereignty has been a concept and a tactic, it was never really the goal because we don't exercise dominion, sovereignty over the natural world. We're kinship in the natural world. We're not kings and queens. So therefore, the kinship systems that we see here in the movement are part of an extension of the natural kinship systems, which we also formulate part of in the natural world and into the cosmetic dimensions of our ties with the stars that the coyote was always talking to them. Talk to me just a little bit more about the coyote before we go. Well, it's a relative, a very dear and mischievous relative that you could say that and you could smile about it because you're thinking about the kind of mentality that Arthur Manuel, for example, exemplified. The only thing that's missing here is the profanity, right? But in any case, uh, we're speaking about, in our language, Koyo, that's a word that comes from our language, the Nahuatlaka. Nekane no Toka, Tupac, and Rika, that's Nahuatlaka speaking. And that word Koyo comes from our language. It means a singing dog, literally. But metaphorically, that four-legged creature who, and then he said, I'm going to sing a song. Well, that's an essence of our nation. We're creatures who sing the world into existence. And that song has told us now, it's time to fight for Mother Earth, time to stop the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline, and it's time to defend the watersheds of Mother Earth in this territory and across the world because there's no such thing as seven seas, world, water, one. You scared of Donald Trump? No, I'm, I'm scared. Of, we don't have fear. We don't operate in fear, but we are very apprehensive of the damage that he can do in the position of power as such an ignorant fool could be placed into, but to what end, to what purpose? Again, what we see is the transnational, metanational corporations 
and moved into imperial position in the international global Petropolis empire to where they are mandating policies at all levels, financial, monetary, political, ecological, climate. They've gone beyond the government state system. The UN to them is just an appendage, an appendage to be used when they need it and disregarded when they don't need to. They're operating on an entirely different level. It's a form of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of economy and imperialism that's operating with a sophistication never seen before. And Trump is their puppet. Two seconds, just one last thing. You know, I've been thinking about Trump and the sort of view of the world that he represents, right? He's, he's, all, he's always talking about the deal, right? That he's gonna get a better deal, which really means he's gonna extract more from the other person and get more, you know, for himself or his side. And, you know, his most famous book, of course, is The Art of the Deal. And um, there's something about that idea, yeah. his idea of the deal, yeah. I think in contrast to the treaty, Sure. And what and can you so what is the difference between <coughs> the art of the treaty and the art of the deal? Well, first of all, we have to understand, and again, this is what, what the coyote was always talking about. As original nations, we have treaties with Mother Earth, with the eagles, with the deer, with the coyotes. We have treaties with each other. But our essential treaties are treaties with Mother Earth. In other words, we have uh, understandings and responsibilities to our territories, with our territories and our other kinship relative nations on the territories, the deer, the coyotes, the birds, etc., the fish. We're talking about two different systems of jurisgenesis, which have produced two distinct systems of jurisprudence and have led to two competing and conflicting systems of jurisdiction, the fight here, that have led to these judgments. On one side, the judgment of the deal is a contractual concept where it's tit for tat, right? Tat for tit, right? Trump's version. In other words, their legal systems are pushed towards that adversarial contractual domination, winner loser type of, 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 uh, of, uh, of systemic relationships, whereas ours are based on respect. Respect for life, respect for our role and responsibility in life. It's not a tit for tat situation. They're two distinct uh, uh, jurisgenesis visions of the world that have left you these systems of jurisprudence, jurisdiction, and judgments. For that reason, we're standing where we're doing, where we're standing doing what we do. And for that reason, the extractive model, which is based on the contractual cosmovision of being apart from the natural world and being able to deal with it as if it was a commodity. It's not only leading us to the climate chaos scenario, it's completely false. It's a false reality. It's not based on science at all. Ask the quantum physicists and they'll tell you the same thing.